المسيح كم حكان كم كريستوس أنستي أليثوس أنستي Christ is risen Christ indeed has risen these are the standard Easter greetings of churches in the East and in fact in the Middle East for the time period from the Sunday of the resurrection until new Sunday the following Sunday now called Mercy Sunday people don't even greet each other the usual ways they just say Christ is risen indeed he is written risen come and this is a time of great joy of course we are dealing with a certain amount of sadness uh, quite a number of people have died I believe worldwide it's almost a hundred thousand have died from the um, coronavirus and in our own country many also have died it's beginning to subside a bit but you know we lament the deaths of so many and I have known people who are sick and recovered but also am aware of friends and uh, or family of friends who have died and it's still difficult in many places so that makes for a certain amount of grief for us during this season of the resurrection but in this season we do well to take a look at the sacred scriptures many many places are presenting uh, the sacred liturgy online Facebook and YouTube of course EWTN is broadcasting and it's been truly amazing for us how many countries are now accepting the EWTN feed for these services I think that this is a great thing um, that we are be able to celebrate and I would very much like us to consider a few things in regard to this great celebration of the Lord's resurrection you know it was fairly common to have scholars deny that Jesus rose from the dead uh, especially in the 20th century frankly the reason that some of them did so had nothing to do with evidence there's no evidence against the resurrection um, now we also have to admit that this is an issue of faith and yet faith has to deal with various facts as well and then within the data that we have we make an act of faith so there's certainly that element but a lot of these scholars in the 20th century were rejecting the resurrection because it did not fit with their existentialist philosophy especially after the two world wars one philosopher who came to prominence was named Martin Heidegger and he believed that authentic faith is possible only as you face death because he de defined human life as being towards death that's the definition of humanity beings toward death now this is a very important characteristic of humanity that we unlike the other animals are aware that we are all going to die some of us like to be like the animals in that we want to ignore our inevitable death in fact I don't 
think that it is irrelevant to point out that so many people such as uh, Alfred Kinsey of the Kinsey Report saw human sexuality as being just like animal sexuality and therefore we're no different than the animals and the animals have no guilt which is true uh, they they don't feel guilt they feel angry they get mean I've been hunting deer in the rut and deer are mean to each other they try to kill each other and some and I've known them to do it uh, so there's that but they don't feel guilt about their sexual des desires and urges or their violence of killing the other deer that get in the way of them being able to breed. They don't feel any guilt about that at all. They make me look like St. Francis. So this is not the issue. And a lot of these folks like Kinsey and many others will say, well, our sexuality is just like that of the animals. But just as they model their sexuality on the animals, they also ignore death and the meaning of death the way the animals do. So in that sense, Heidegger was right. We are able to face death and we can find meaning in it. That's for sure. And that is a good thing. And those who model themselves on animals that ignore the reality of death until it's over, we very much uh, can be different by facing it. In fact, it's not at all unlike uh, a lot of people to realize that uh, like the animals, they think when they die, they just cease to exist their soul doesn't exist anymore they use the animals as a model for the sexuality which is about the beginning of life and about their attitude towards death which is the end of life and this is something that is uh, not a christian approach but then to follow heidegger the way people like rudolf Bultmann and many other scholars who followed him. Bultmann was the dominant scholar of New Testament studies in the mid to the nearly the end of the 20th century. And he taught that the resurrection was not a real fact. What it was is the community so desired Christ to remain among them and they somehow felt his presence among them that they believed in this resurrection and they told stories but you can add the words they invented stories of the resurrection and that would be the bottom line and Bultmann talked about his project. The main way he approached the New Testament was through something, he invented a good German word, Entmetallgesehrung, which means demythologizing. He <clears throat> was going to get rid of the resurrection myth and, you know, get rid of that because if we believe in the resurrection, we won't face death. The, the resurrection gives a way out of death. And he rejected that because he was more committed to Heidegger's philosophy than he was to the witness to Christ. Bultmann was a Lutheran, but I would say that he uh, judged his Lutheran faith by Heidegger's philosophy. Now, this influence is not as strong as it once was. I'm going to give you a little side note here. Because by 1986 or 7, 
was 87. Proof positive was shown that Heidegger was a committed Nazi. He didn't just sort of accept a chancellorship for a university from Hitler, which he did. Everybody knew that. But he was actually very committed to the Nazi party. And he participated in uh, having students turn in their Jewish colleagues and professors. And he turned his back on his own professor who was Jewish. Um, so this, this was uh, something that made him despicable and kind of his philosophy was pushed aside. People became embarrassed that somebody who claimed to be such a great philosopher did not have the moral strength to do what my Polish Catholic peasant cousins did. They weren't philosophers, they were farmers, they were peasants living on the land. But they saved Jews, they hid them in their root cellar. So my other cousins put them in the back end of their farm and gave them food the best they could. They joked about giving them sausage made out of pork, but that's all they had and they gave them some of their meat. And, and, and they said, yeah, they ate it anyway, even though they're Jewish. And they joked about that, but they saved their lives. And they were just peasants who had a Catholic upbringing and a Catholic morality. So they saved those Jews. The great philosopher Heidegger did not, did the opposite. That has led to a rejection of a lot of Heidegger's enterprise and his philosophy. And quite frankly, it has also opened up a lot of theologians to question Bultmann too. If the philosophy underlying his rejection of the resurrection is not able to help it's the philosopher behind it become a better man if heidegger who came up with this idea that man is a being toward death if he was not improved by his philosophy then we don't have to really take it that seriously and people are looking again at the resurrection I certainly uh, met some of the uh, fine scholars of the 20th century. One of them came to our, lect our, our class. He was invited by our, my New Testament professor to come and lecture us. And when we asked him why he lost his faith in Christ, he said, well, I lost my faith in the trenches of World War II in North Africa. He fought with the British Army there in North Africa. And that's where he lost his faith. That, I, I very much remember thinking to myself, well, that's dumb. The last place I would want to lose my faith is when my life was in great danger. And furthermore, I also knew many people and my father was a vet, and many uh, <laughs> the fathers of all the kids I grew up with were World War II vets. And they talked about how their faith became real when they were fighting. So I said, well, this guy doesn't have any good reasoning any more than Heidegger does, uh, whom he was explicitly following, by the way. That was Norman Perrin that came to us. Instead, people are now looking more carefully at the Easter narratives. And there are a number of things I want to bring out. One of the most important themes of all Jesus' appearances on the day of the resurrection is that his appearance evoked a conversion. You do not see any disciples, and certainly not the apostles, 
hanging around the tomb, expecting Jesus to be raised from the dead. None of them are saying, well, third day, time to rise. Nothing like that at all. Instead, we see the holy women approach the tomb with spices in order to anoint the corpse of Jesus. Why? They expected there to be a corpse. They did not expect the resurrection. They expected a dead body. And when they come back telling the apostles that they saw Jesus, they say, oh, that's silly women's tales, old, old women's talk, which is very insulting and sexist to say the least. But it was just a way to be dismissive because they did not believe it. Oh, do you think maybe Jesus did rise from the dead the way he said he was? I don't know. What do you guys think? No. They thought it was just silly talk. And it takes a long time before the two disciples on the way to Emmaus recognize Jesus. Only in the breaking of the bread do they recognize him when they arrive at Emmaus. And then in the upper room, you see that the apostles see Jesus and they think he's a ghost. That's easier to accept. That's easier to believe. And our Lord has to convince them and said, touch me. A ghost does not have flesh and blood. Even still they had trouble believing when they touched him. And so he said, well, give me something to eat. Ghosts don't eat. It was still great difficulty in believing what they saw what they touched, and the one with whom they were eating a meal. If you ever saw the old cartoons of Casper the ghost, they'd give him food and it'd fall right down on the ground because he couldn't uh, eat anything. He was the ghost. But Jesus is not a ghost. And he's able to be touched and he's able to eat food. Now, we also see that even after they do get convinced, Thomas, who was not there, does not believe their story. He says, unless I touch the wounds of the nails in his hands and his feet and put my hand in his side, I won't believe it. And so, and then again, it's the same guys. Thomas is there, Peter, John, and James, and a couple of other disciples are in a boat some weeks later up in the Sea of Galilee and they see and they still don't recognize him and then our Lord has to confront them about who he is by having them cast their net on the other side of the boat why do I go all through all this these episodes that the Apostles tell on themselves and the disciples relate about themselves. These episodes all show that unlike Bultmann's silly idea, the apostles were not waiting for the resurrection. They did not have such a great faith that Jesus would rise like he said he would and we're just going to wait for him and we believe he's still present. No! They each had to experience a conversion to believe that it really was Jesus Christ. In fact, when Mary Magdalene sees the Lord at first, she says, Sir, if you've taken away the body, tell me where it is and I'll take care of it. She, when she sees Jesus, she thinks it's the gardener who for some reason moved the body out of the tomb. She doesn't believe until he calls her by name. And then she's experiencing a conversion. This is key. And it's key for all of us perhaps particularly in this time 
of the coronavirus that we very much need to have a sense of coming to an act of faith. I hope you have or will watch the various uh, broadcasts of the Easter Vigil. And one of the things that you should notice if you haven't noticed it in past years, you should notice it again, especially for those who are in the Roman Rite, that we do not say the creed on this feast. On the celebration of the resurrection, whether it's the Easter Vigil or the um, uh, Easter uh, morning Mass, we do not Pray the creed. Why not? Because instead of the creed, everybody renews their baptismal vows. And the priest asks the question, do you believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? This was asked at your baptism when most of us Catholics were infants. And now, as children, and as adolescents, as adults, or in my case, as senior citizens, we are to say to that question, I do. I do believe. We profess our faith. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of uh, the Virgin Mary, who suffered in Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, rose again from the dead, and will come again on the last day to judge the living and, and the dead. Do you believe? And we're, we respond, I do. Now, if you're just watching on TV, say it anyway. Make that profession of faith. And do you believe in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting? Do you believe that? And the response is, I do. And this is very important because a few whiny Catholics sometimes say, well, I was a baby and I didn't make that act of faith. Okay, I understand. Stop your whining. You can make it now. And every Easter we repeat that. We are to join Mary Magdalene and coming to believe that Jesus is raised from the dead. We are to be like the other holy women at the empty tomb, expecting to anoint a corpse, but now we see that he's gone and we join them in converting more deeply. Maybe we've already had a great conversion in our lives, but we can deepen that conversion now and say, I do believe, I do. We can be like the apostles on the way to Emmaus, those disciples that finally felt a burning in their hearts as Jesus spoke to them about how he fulfilled the scriptures. And when we, we every time we hear, do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, and who spoke through the prophets? Do you believe? You can make that act of faith. Now is the day to make that act of faith. And you can be like the apostles who thought it was a ghost. That was easier to understand for them than the resurrection. And like them, we come to this recognition of Christ and we say, I do. I do. And are we also able to be like the apostles in the boat who finally cry out, it is the Lord. We can say, I do. We see all of these episodes, and we'll be reading from these Gospels all week long, every day during Easter week, the octave of Easter, and for some of the Sundays afterwards. About Doubting Thomas on Mercy Sunday. We 
can renew that same act of faith as we see them convert to believe in Jesus and his resurrection, then we also can do that. And, you know, it's important to note how our Lord addressed each one of those people in the Gospels uniquely. He also approaches us uniquely so that we can have that conversion. That's key. A second thing, we also see that as they come to that act of faith, then our Lord can explain more deeply the meaning of his life, death, and resurrection. What happens on the way to Emmaus? He explains the scriptures from Moses through the prophets, showing those passages that prove he was the Messiah and that the Messiah had to suffer and die. They understood the meaning of his suffering. It wasn't a defeat like they thought at first. It wasn't a matter of their hearts being broken and disappointed because we thought he might be the Messiah. We thought he was a prophet. And now some women bring these tales and Christ has to explain to them the meaning of what happened by revealing the scriptures to them. Many of the scriptures that we've been hearing, especially this Holy Week, This past Holy Week, we heard from Isaiah 50 and Isaiah 53 about the suffering Messiah. And Zechariah prophesying that the Son of Man would be coming on a donkey and coming into Jerusalem riding humbly on an ass. These prophecies we've been reading through Lent. And we need to allow Jesus to deepen our understanding of the meaning of the resurrection. And he approaches each one of them. When he's with the apostles on the road to Emmaus and in the upper room, he explains the scriptures. When he meets with Peter at the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he asks him three times, do you love me? Once, one protestation of love for each of the denials of Jesus that Peter had committed. And it's no accident that these questions, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me more than these? Peter, do you love me? Those questions by Christ addresses St. Peter, who had denied that he would ever deny Jesus until it came time, and then he just denied the Lord. Now he undoes his lack of faith by professing love. Is that not a fascinating thing? His act of love undoes his infidelity. It undoes his fear. This is very, very important. That's, in fact, that scene is what gives meaning to the words of the first epistle of St. John, the author of that gospel, of John. And in 1 John chapter 4, he says, perfect love casts out all fear. That's what Peter learned, and Christ addressed him, and Peter was able to see that there was a deeper meaning even in his denials, one that is met with by professing to love Christ and then hearing Jesus reinstate him as his new good shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd of the flock. But after Peter professes love, he says, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, tend my flock. He makes him the shepherd and restates his leadership in the church. This is very important, very important. And each one of us very much needs to encounter Christ. We need to meditate on these texts 
of the resurrection to find out how Christ addresses my need for meaning, my need, need to have the meaning of the resurrection made more clear to me so that I can integrate this act of faith in him, this conversion to deeper faith in Jesus in everything else I do. So I want that deepening of meaning as well. The third thing we see in all these events of the resurrection is that our Lord also recommissions his disciples and his apostles. He'll say to the holy women, Go and tell my brethren, I will see them up in Galilee. He gives them a mission to go out and tell the others. In fact, with Mary Magdalene, the title given to her by the fathers of the church is He Apostole Tois Apostolois. She is the female apostle to the male apostles. She's the one sent by Jesus to tell them of this resurrected Jesus that she just saw, that she just heard call him by name. So he tells her not to cling to him, but to be about the mission. There's a recommission. And the same is true of the apostles. As he explains all of the passages of the Old Testament that refer to him, he tells them, you will be my witnesses here in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. He'll give them a new commission. After their lack of faith, after their fear and cowardice, he will give them a commission. Up in Galilee, in Matthew chapter 28, you'll see a large crowd of his disciples, probably the crowd of about 500 that St. Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, right at the beginning of the chapter. And that he says to that crowd, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptize, teaching them everything I taught you and baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He gives them this commission to be in a mission to the whole world. So the women have a mission to the apostles, the apostles have a mission to the whole world, and they go out and spread the gospel before they've died, before they will have died. The apostles will have preached all the way from Spain to India. And disciples who hear Christ commissioning them in every age have continued the mission and taken the gospel to the ends of the earth. Now, this Easter, let us consider those three aspects. Meeting the risen Lord calls an, a conversion from us. Secondly, we also see that we need to understand the meaning of his life, death, resurrection, ascension, and second coming for our own sakes. What, what does this mean for us? And integrate that meaning and seek that like the apostles did. And thirdly, we need to hear Christ recommission us. This virus isolation will not last for too much longer. It should be overcome. We'll be able to get back to church. But it's going to be our duty to also go back and accept the commission to preach to the ends of the earth, baptizing all nations in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them everything Jesus taught. Not part, not the part we like, but the whole. This is going to be very much something that is a blessing for us. And I think to 
look upon this feast. I don't know how much you'll be able to celebrate. It'll be probably a lot more quiet than usual. Maybe more low-key than usual. Hopefully, if you get over to the store, you can find something to have as a little bit of a treat, you know, a little bit of an enjoyment. But it'll be slow, slower kind of pace this Easter for all of us, I'm sure. But something that does not need to change at all is the call to convert, to believe more deeply in the resurrection, to understand the meaning of it, and to hear Christ commission us again. May this fill you with great joy in this Easter season and with great hope that we will once again be able to join each other around the Eucharistic table and give glory to God and enter more deeply into communion with Jesus Christ personally by receiving him in the Holy Eucharist and have that deeper union amongst ourselves as a church as we firm up the bonds that unite us bonds that are not based on our emotions or even on physically seeing each other or touching each other but rather bonds that come because it is Jesus Christ whom we receive and whom we believe that holds us together more firmly than the ligaments of our own bodies may God bless you throughout this holy season of the resurrection Christ is risen indeed he is risen may God bless you the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit Amen.